us for today's Missouri Trail Blazers program. I'm Mary Weather Lewis and William Clark, presented to you today by the Missouri State Museum. My name is Pam Stone, and I work as a senior associate here at the Holt Summit Public Library, a branch of the Daniel Boone Regional Library. If you have the opportunity to come visit us at our branch, please do so. We'd love to say hi, check out a few things I for you, um, and for you to check out our library. Now, believe it or not, this is our second program of the Missouri Trailblazer series. And on the third Tuesday of each month, from now through August, at one o'clock, the Missouri State Museum staff will present a variety of virtual lunch and learn programs that offer tales and some of the interesting people who have had the opportunity to call the great show me state their home. A trailblazer is someone who has impacted our culture through major events, leadership, innovation, and more. I personally would like to say a special thank you to Carrie Hammond, the Education Specialist for the Missouri State Museum. She is responsible for organizing all of these great presentations. So thank you, Carrie. In just a second, I'm going to turn things over to Carrie. She's gonna talk a little bit about the Missouri State Museum. After all, it is your history. And then she's gonna throw it back to me and I'll introduce you to Henry. Carrie, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Pam, and thank you all for joining us today for the Missouri Trailblazers program. And my name is Carrie Hammond. I'm the Education Specialist for the Missouri State Museum. And we opened our new Trailblazer exhibit in November of 2020 after a very long awaited planning and production process. We had numerous staff help with the project and it really became a labor of love for many of us. The theme of Trailblazers came about from the year's Missouri State Bicentennial anniversary. What a better way to commemorate this historical year than highlighting some exceptional people that have helped make our state extraordinary by providing leadership, innovation, and creativity. The Trailblazer exhibit displays, the rotate every few months. So there's always new things to see. So we want everyone to, you know, to encourage you to come in and look at that and keep coming back. And we also have a brand new exhibit called Memory and Cloth, which highlights military flags and banners. And we'll also rotate new examples every six months from the more than 400 flags and banners in the collection. Now these date back as far as the 1830s. So some of those are really spectacular. So we, you know, we want everyone to come by the museum if they have the chance, check out the Trailblazers exhibit and our new bicentennial timeline that highlights important dates throughout Missouri history. And the State Museum is open Monday to Friday, eight to five and Saturday and Sunday, nine to four. Now to go along with the wonderful program like today's Lewis and Clark, we offer traveling trunks for reservation and we actually have a Lewis and Clark traveling trunk. Now this trunk can be checked out for usually up to a two week period. That does fluctuate depending on how many people are gonna be using it. So we're more than happy to work with people on that. Um, and these are reserved by schools, libraries, home schools, even families can reserve these trunks. So it's really not um, you know, boxed into any particular group of people. So everyone is welcome to do that. And they come with super cool hands-on activities, artifacts, lesson plans, and all of these enrich education uh, for the core discovery and its team members. Now, this trunk and many other trunks are available for reservation. And you can do that by calling, you can call my personal number or my personal email. And I'm gonna actually put those in the chat and I'm gonna uh, put in the website where you can go and look at all the different trunks. We have them all listed, we have some pictures so you get a pretty good idea what's in each trunk. And we also have the item lists for those. And some of the lesson plans are even online as well. So you have all of those resources at your fingertips, either before you reserve the trunk or after you bring it home. All right, and I'll get those in the chat and back to you, Pam. Thank you, Carrie. that sounds great. I do see that someone asked where the Missouri State Museum is located at. It is actually located within the Capitol there in Jefferson City. You can't miss it, big building right over across the river. With that being said, today's program, which is about Meriwether Lewis and William Clark is presented today by Henry Ginsky. Henry Ginsky has been working as a part-time interpreter for the Missouri State Museum for over 25 years. I personally have had the pleasure of working with Henry in the past and have greatly enjoyed it and have learned a lot about him, Henry, as well as history. 
In addition to providing tours of the Capitol, Henry often has about 15 different PowerPoint presentations ready to go for any museum after hours program that uh, is taking place. He also uh, presents programs for the historic city of Jefferson to which he is a board member, as well as many other community groups. So we wanna say welcome to Henry. And with that being said, Henry, would you like to start your program today? Uh, I'm so happy that you invited me, Pam. And uh, I wanted to uh, make one slight correction. I've only been a part-time capital interpreter for about 10 or 11 years. You've been with the museum. Even more <laughs> well, I've been with the museum 25 years. So anyway, um, the, uh, I, I enjoyed working on this particular program and it involved uh, so much, so many things that I didn't know and that I know now, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. I found some things about the Capitol that uh, I'm sure you'll uh, wonder what was going on. But at any rate, uh, uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, I hope you enjoy the program, so. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and share the screen here. This is a pre-recorded program, just like the previous program, folks. And we will be taking questions after the video is over with, and I hope you all enjoy. Meriwether Lewis was the, became the private secretary to President Thomas Jefferson in January of 1801. So he had a bird's eye view of all the negotiations and the final treaty of the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. President Jefferson wanted to, very much to explore all this new territory. For $15 million, we doubled the size of the country. So he asked uh, Meriwether Lewis, and he also extended the invitation to George Rogers Clark, who was a colonel in the Revolutionary War and a hero. And uh, Colonel Clark declined because at my age of 51, I'm too old. So he recommended his younger brother, William Clark, who he has been very close to and who he had homeschooled, educated. William Clark accepted him. So they planned the uh, expedition, which originally was known as the Corps of Discovery, more commonly called the Lewis and Clark Exposition. So finally, uh, Meriwether Lewis asked William Clark to do all the recruiting of approximately 41 people that were required. So he went back east, and uh, in the process, he ran across a 16-year-old boy by the name of George Shannon, an Irishman from uh, Pennsylvania, and he wanted, I think, Shannon pursued him as much as the other way around. Anyway, he hired him, and he was the youngest person on the uh, expedition, and a very valuable individual, which you will see later. So anyway, uh, William Clark, in addition to that, he was required to uh, equip the entire expedition. So they ended up in St. Charles, Missouri, and they finally left there in uh, May of 1800, uh, 1804. And they traveled up the Missouri River, passing various different spots, including the future location of Jefferson City. So when they got to Jackson County, they noted a very excellent spot on top of a bluff that would be an excellent outpost. And it was noted in their journal. Meriwether Lewis had the responsibility of keeping the journal. I'm sorry, beg your pardon, it was William Clark. So anyway, they noted this, and this later became Fort Osage, established in 1808. So they traveled, they continued to travel up the uh, river and they finally reached the Mandam Indian Territory in the Dakotas and Montana. And they decided that they'd spend the winter there. And in the meantime, they had sent a small delegation back to St. Charles to report on their progress. So it was here they ran into Sacagawea, the Shoshone woman and her husband, Toussaint Arbanau. Very little is given to him. He was a French trapper, and I'm sure he contributed something to the expedition. But anyway, he accompanied him. She agreed that she would take the expedition across the Rocky Mountains and the Continental Divide all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So uh, they started out in the spring of 1805, and they finally ended up in uh, Long Beach, Washington, which is right on the Pacific coast and the mouth of the Columbia River. 
and they had decided that they would spend the next winter there, the 1805 to 1806. So uh, they started their return journey in the spring of 1806. When they got back to the Mandam Indian Territory where Sacagawea was located, they um, rested there for a week or so. And then they had a small delegation of an Indian chief and his wife that wanted to go back with them to Washington, D.C. So they left, of course, their water transportation was left there. So they boarded their water transportation and headed down the Missouri River, a much easier going with the flow of the current as opposed to going up. Anyway, they arrived in St. Charles in September of 1806, and much to the surprise of everyone because they had been given up for loss because it had been over two years since they had heard from them. So they hurried to Washington, D.C., reported to the president, and uh, uh, George Shannon at that point was given the special responsibility, he and a small group, to take the Indians back to their territory, which he did. He ran into an, several hundred Arikara Indians, and they had fought a battle, and there were about 10 or 12 of his original group that uh, were killed, and of course he was shot in the knee. And they had no medical attention at that point in time, so they dropped the Indians off, they hurriedly went back to St. Charles, and he reported to a Belfonte Hospital in St. Louis, which was an army installation at that time. And they treated him for the better part of a year, and they finally ended up having to amputate the leg. And they fitted him out with a wooden leg, and from that point on, he was known as Peg Leg Shannon. Now, his duties didn't stop there. William Clark, like I said, kept the journal, and he was asked, and he turned it over to the president, and the president wanted it printed. So he asked a Mr. Thomas Riddle in Philadelphia to print it. Well, Mr. Riddle had a very difficult, a lot of difficulty reading William Clark's words. William Clark spelt Sioux Indians like in 27 different ways. But George Shannon was very familiar with it because he also kept a small personal journal. So William Clark asked him to go to Philadelphia and translate, so to speak. So he did. And after that, uh, William Clark received, uh, was able to get him a disability pension of nine, eight dollars a month. He enrolled in Transylvania University in law school, and that paid for his room and board. So anyway, he, uh, he, he graduated with uh, Henry Clay, a very famous uh, senator from Kentucky. Anyway, he moved back to Missouri, practiced law, became a judge, and uh, he, uh, Shannon County was named after him in 1841. So uh, Meriwether Lewis became um, territorial governor in 1807. And he was on his way to Washington, D.C. to report to the president. And he decided in that, in that particular time, his headquarters was in New Orleans because we were not a state, it was just uh, upper Louisiana. Anyway, he, uh, he rode horseback and he got into Southwest Tennessee on the uh, Natchez Trace and he stayed at a lodging called the Grinder House. And he, sometime during the night of October the 11th, 1809, he was shot and killed, two shots. There was a lot of speculation and who and why and when and where, but he was buried right there on the property. So finally in 1848, the state of Tennessee said, we've got to do something about Meriwether Lewis. So there was a 68-year-old surveyor who was still living in the area and he knew exactly where he was buried. So he pinpointed it, they verified it, and they put uh, a large monument there, which you can see the picture of. And uh, later on, this became a federal park, Natchez Trace Federal Park. So in 1816, uh, William Clark was also appointed territorial governor, and he served until 1820 when Alexander McNair, the first Missouri governor, was elected. Uh, he lived until 1838, and uh, he died, and he was buried on a relative's farm in St. Louis. That acreage and later became part of Belfonte Cemetery. So uh, his only son, living in St. Louis, wanted something better as far as uh, his uh, particular grave marker is concerned. So when he died in uh, around 1900, he left $25,000 to 
uh, uh, put up a beautiful monument. And you can see the picture here. $25,000 in 1899 or 1900 was worth $420,000 today. So you can see what he bought, what, what, he, what he bought. Beautiful place. When the, this particular capital was finished, they felt like they had to do something with Lewis and Clark. So the two alcoves, and you can see the two pictures here, the two alcoves on either side of this third floor, we have an eight foot statue, bronze statues of William Clark and Mary Worthy Lewis in their traveling wardrobe. They were dedicated between May and July of 1928. Everybody was happy, but in 1951, a freshman representative, Richard Webster and Clifford Jones, found out that they had been placed on the wrong pedestals. Clark was on the one and Lewis was on the other one. So they initiated some effort to try to get them, just to, to switch them. This went on for 25 years. People took it up. But in the 1880, I'm sorry, 1981, Representative Bud Barnes took it over. And he asked several different experts to come in and reconfirm the fact that they were on the wrong pedestal. And so finally, on September 25th, 1986, they were put on the proper pedestals, which is where they are today, and an official record was made of it. Now, I can't imagine they were on the wrong pedestal for 58 years. <laughs> what happened? But at any rate, what we have now is that you can see the two statues. Um, James E. Frazier was the sculptor that did the two Lewis and Clark statues on the third floor of the Capitol as well as the Thomas Jefferson statue on the south steps of the Capitol. And that is considered the, the finest statue of Thomas Jefferson in the country. So uh, he uh, uh, was given the commission to do those two, and he did a beautiful job. But we wanted to, they wanted to do something about Sacagawea. So if you'll look at the picture of Sacagawea, we, she's honored with a bust in the Hall of Famous Missourians. And she was installed in 1993. And at the time, the speaker said she is a, a woman of mystery. So William J. Williams, a sculptor from Columbia and a teacher at one of the colleges, was given the commission. And he previously he had done uh, 15 or 20 of these up here. So he was presented with a quite of a problem because there was no pictures. That was before photography. He didn't know. So anyway, he went to the Library of Congress and they had all kind of drawing of Shoshone women. And so he made up this composite and he said, well, he said, I, I'm reasonably sure in my own mind, this is the way she looked. So now she's also so famous. And the other thing is she never ever set foot on Missouri soil, which she's the only bust in this that, that falls in that category. Um, and that's something that whenever we have school children here, fourth, fifth grade, third grade, I always, po I always stop here and I say, uh, what was the name of the Indian lady that went with Lewis and Clark? I have 100%. They always know Sacagawea. Now, unfortunately, he was never given any credit. Like I said, I'm sure he contributed something. But at any rate, uh, uh, I was always surprised. One time, I remember there was a long hesitancy. He said, now children, surely you know. You don't want to be the first one that doesn't know the answer. And someone popped up and said, oh, it's Sacagawea. Well, yeah. I said, good. So anyway, um, this uh, probably would conclude the program. And if anybody has any questions, I would be very happy to try to answer them for you. Alrighty, so we are ready to answer some questions for you all. If anyone has some, just let us know. Okay, I have a couple that came in hot off the presses. Alrighty, go right ahead. Okay, the first one, Henry, is Does George Shannon have a national grave site memorial like Lewis and Clark? No, he doesn't. He was buried in Palmyra, Missouri, in the Massey Cemetery, and he was in an unmarked grave. I can't imagine that is. He had eight children, and at least five of them were still living at the time of his death. So in 1935 or 36, the uh, courthouse, 
they put up a large stone in the, on the front yard of the courthouse noting that George Shannon died and was buried in Palmyra, Missouri. Okay. In 18, I believe it was 1836 when he died. He was, he was in Palmyra to hear a murder case as a judge and he died suddenly. Okay. Another question is, did any of the other Lewis and Clark party members keep journals? Did Shannon ever publish his journal? No, he did not. But uh, as far as I know, was able to determine those are the only two that kept the journal. Mary Werther Lewis, I'm sorry, William Clark, Mary Werther Lewis was the, William Clark, I beg your pardon, William Clark was the one officially designated to keep the journal. And uh, Shannon kept a small one himself and was able to, you know, decipher some of the uh, facts and figures from uh, William Clark. Okay. Uh, someone asked, is Shannon's grave still unmarked? Yeah, I, that I don't know. I assume that it is because if it was if it was marked, they would if it was unmarked, they would have put the uh, uh, something there. I'm, at the time when he was buried, he was a, a very high in the uh, Mason, and they had a very large funeral for him at that point. But I can't imagine that nothing was there. But it's officially listed as an unmarked grave, and they wanted to have something noted, you know, as far as the stone in the courthouse law. So that's all I know about it. Okay, and then another one asked, uh, they noticed that Charles Balsar, and I apologize if I pronounced that incorrectly, uh, on one of the first slides, who was he? Well, what was the name? Charles Balsar, Balsar? Was he, he was a member of the organization, but I don't have any information on him, I'm quite honest with you. Okay. Um, some of the rumors claim that Lewis committed suicide. Did you see any evidence of that in your research? That's been, a, that's been a question all these years. I do know that right before he left New Orleans to go to Washington, D.C., he made his last will. And he previously had tried to commit suicide and was caught in time. So it's a matter of speculation. Nothing was officially that he did or he didn't. But the fact that he was shot twice, you know, uh, leads you to believe and perhaps there was a robbery involved. But that's all we know. Okay. Um, somebody asked, are there any other statues of Sacagawea in Missouri? None that I know of, but that doesn't mean there couldn't be. But I don't think, I think she's the only one. Because of the fact that no one knows what she looked like, you know, that's what, because, you know, the bus, he had to uh, extensively make up something for him. Do we know what happened to Sacagawea after the expedition? She went back and of course she stayed in the Indian territory up in the Dakotas and Montana. And her husband and her were offered uh, some land, several hundred acres of land in Missouri if they wanted to move Missouri. And they both decided no, they'd stay where they were. And we assume that she lived there the rest of her life and, uh, and her husband also. And uh, somewhere in the Dakotas. Now where she's buried, you know, Indian uh, burials are quite different. So I, I don't know whether, she did, but obviously she, uh, that's where she lived and church where she died. Okay. Uh, one of the questions we had was, how, do, how did the freshman representatives find out that the statues were on the wrong pedestal? That's a good question. I can't imagine, my, theory, my own personal theory is, he was somewhat of a historian, Richard Webster, as you know, he became a very famous Missouri Senator and served many, many, many years. And, uh, he made the determination and uh, it was later decided and was later verified that, uh, you know, they were wrong. I can't, I, I would, I often wondered if uh, the sculptor didn't come here for the dedication. If he had come here for the dedication, he would have immediately picked up the air. So I have to assume he was not here at that time. Okay. Someone commented on George Duryard. Uh, any info you can disclose about how Lewis and Clark knew him and his help on the discovery tour? Repeat that name again. George. Repeat that name again. He was the Frenchman, George Drouillard. George Drouillard. Yeah. Do you know, can I you have, discover, do you have any information on him and how? No, I do not. Him? I do not have any information on him. Okay. 
Um, there was someone that mentioned American Slave was also part of the expedition. This is the largest sculpture to date, 18 foot high, built in honor of this group of the explorers. I must have missed the part of that. So I apologize to everyone. Sorry, yes, I did. Excuse me. Somebody had mentioned there is one uh, in Kansas City, the monument of Lewis and Clark in Sacagawea. The sculpture is named the Corps of Discoveries and was created by Eugene Dobb in 2000 as part of the urban renewal of downtown Kansas City. It is located in Case Park at Clark's Point. It portrays Lewis, Clark, and Sacagawea and her son, John Baptiste, on the back, on her back. And the opposite to Sacagawea is York, an African-American slave who was also part of the expedition. This is the largest sculpture to date, 18 foot high in height, built to in built in honor of this group of the explorers. Okay. Do you have any information on the Lewis and Clark statues outside the Capitol facing the governor's mansion? Uh, yes, this was put up in 2006, and it shows Lewis and Clark, uh, their uh, the, the dog that went with them, and uh, several, uh, two or three different people. But uh, I do know that uh, uh, there was a gentleman here in town, a, a retired doctor that donated the substantial amount of money that they were able to create the statue. And uh, the uh, statue was created by uh, this female uh, person in Colombia, uh, and uh, she uh, uh, also did several of the statues in the Hall of Famous Missourians, beyond the gentleman that did the first 25 or so. So uh, uh, I had an opportunity to talk to her one time, and she told me all about how she had to research, you know, the exact clothing and how they were and so on, until she created the statues up on the, near the Capitol. Okay. The next question is, why was George Shannon at such a young age recruited for this journey? Because he was, for his age, was very well educated. In fact, he was, he was born in uh, Western Pennsylvania in the Pittsburgh area. They later emigrated to Ohio. And he was so interested in it because, uh, and he pursued William Clark. William Clark was in that area having all of the water transportation manufactured. And so finally, it was October of 1804, I guess it was, before they uh, uh, finished it. And, and he came on down the Ohio River to St. Charles with them. And uh, he found out later that he was a very, very valuable member of the. And he, you might say he was in training at, at age 16. And there were certain things that he didn't know about living in the wilderness. But by the time he got back, he knew it all. <laughs> The next question I have is, you mentioned that Shannon County is named after George Shannon. Are there any other Missouri counties named after Lewis and Clark or any of their party members? Uh, there's none of, the, none of the party members are named after him. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, Clark or Lewis. There might be other counties. I'm, I must confess I did not uh, um, check into that part of the thing, but it's a possibility. We have uh, over a hundred counties, so, and of course, Shannon County was named after him about 14 years after he died, so, okay. in 1841. Okay. Um, did all of the members of the Corps of Discoveries make it back to St. Charles alive? All but one. There was one, for whatever reason, died on the journey. Everything else, everyone else came back. Okay. And I think, in the I think in the final analysis, there was something like 50 instead of 41. Uh, my later research after I finished it found out that there were something like 50 people in total. We have a comment here. Uh, Sabra Toolmeyer, which I also had the privilege of meeting at the museum, she's lovely, uh, from Columbia, Missouri. Hold on, my thing just moved. Okay, uh, this lady uh, that has commented, has had the opportunity to be working with Sabra together for seven years on the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial Monument, which will be located in the Katy Trailhead Park, which is at the Capitol Complex directly across from the Carnahan Gardens. That's right. Sabra was the one I couldn't think of the name of a while ago. And I might want to make a comment about Sabra. 
she did one of the statues in the uh, Hall of Famous Missourians, a, uh, a Roman Catholic nun, very famous for being a teacher and so on. And someone asked her one time, how did she like to do it? That, it was one of her first ones. She said, how did she like to doing that? And she said, oh, it was so easy. And I said, well, it didn't look easy to me. She said, well, I didn't have to do her ears because she had her habit on. Okay. Uh, excuse me, I need to do a retraction. I uh, misread the attendees part that she put on there uh, that she was just quoting that, that about the statue for about Sabra Toolmeyer. Um, she also wanted to know, would this be a female sculptor from Columbia that you spoke of? Yes, that's the one, Sabra Toolmeyer. Right, that's the one I couldn't think of her name. Okay. She's the one. Okay. And then somebody had commented that Saint Floyd, or Sergeant Floyd, he's buried in what's now known as Sioux City, Iowa. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? No, I did not. Okay. okay. We've got someone with their hand raised, um, okay. Annie Balthazar, and I can uh, allow you to talk if you want to uh, ask your question. Just have to unmute yourself. Or maybe Annie raised her hand on accident. <laughs> maybe she raised her hand on accident. Sorry, we can we can okay. can move on. Okay, uh, I have another question here. Have I? Um, has there ever been any discussion of upgrading Lewis's grave marker so it matches his, matches Clark's marker that you know of? Uh, yes, uh, they had some relative back in the late 1930s, wanted to do something extra farm and possibly. And they said, no, it was against the law. You could not do this. The federal park and what was there had to remain there and in whatever form that it was. So it died off. They tried it for several different years, but nothing ever came of it because of the rule. Okay. So what you see is what you got. <laughs> I was curious, Henry, out of your research that extensive research for Lewis and Clark, what was the most fascinating piece of information that you found out personally that stayed with you that you did not know before? Um, you mean about the, uh, any, any, or Lewis or Clark? Yeah, either one or anybody from the party. Well, the one with uh, Meriwether Lewis, when I got to investigating why he was going to Washington, D.C., there was someone that accused him of doing something that he didn't do. And that's why he hurriedly wanted to get to Washington, DC. So you know, as far as William Clark is concerned, he remained in St. Louis for the rest of his life. And until he became a territorial governor, he, was, he, handled, he handled all the Indian affairs, all the treaties and so on and so forth. So. Okay. Uh, where are Clark's original journals kept and are they viewable by the public? I would assume that they're kept in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Certainly that would be the place where they were. And the president wanted them printed and he was in Washington. And I'm, I don't know that positively, but that would be my best educated guess. Okay. There'd, be, there'd, be, no, there'd be no reason to have it anyplace else. <laughs> okay. Um, someone said that they think that might be at the boathouse in St. Charles. There are some that they might not be the originals. So we'll see. Does anyone else have any questions or did I miss anything, Warren? I say, Henry, is there anything that you didn't get asked that you, that you wish you had? Any other bit of, of trivia or things that we, we should know? And maybe this, this is a very basic question that some people might have is why, why did the expedition start where it did? I assume it's the, uh, the river and, and just it was geographically um, the place to begin. Did you catch that, Henry? No, I didn't. So uh, why did the expedition kind of start where it did? You know, was it just geographically and that made the most sense for it to be the place to begin? Well, obviously, if they're going to go up the Missouri River, that would be the place to start because the Missouri River ends up in the Dakotas where you can jump across it. And so the, that was right in the middle of uh, all the acquired territory. So 
from that point on, they were uh, on canoes and on their foot, on, on horses and so on. So that's where Sacagawea came in to the picture because they ran into a lot of Indian people on the way to the West Coast. And she was able to negotiate safe passage and also whatever additional equipment that they needed in the way of canoes and so on. Also, are there any facts that you kind of wish that you just wanted to share or questions that you kind of wish someone had asked that you'd kind of like to share that you hadn't thought of when you made the presentation? Um, anything like that? No, except the only other thing you could make a very big issue of uh, George Pegleg Shannon. Uh, I discovered all of his uh, family and one point I wanted to make. One of his children, a daughter, lived in Mexico, Missouri, and she died in 1908. And the other was a son that lived in Fresno, California, but died in 1910. But I thought the Mexico, Missouri uh, daughter Surely must have tried to visit the grave in Palmyra, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Okay, do we have any other questions, Lauren, or did I miss anything in the chat side? Oh, I see one that just popped up. Do you have any favorite reading materials, novels, books about the expedition? For instance, uh, this person said that my interest began when reading The Undaunted Courage for this individual. There are several books at the local regional library. You can check them out because they're uh, uh, one of a kind, I suppose. Anyway, I, I use that and I don't remember the name of it, but it says one of them, I think, was the men of, uh, of the uh, Corps of Discovery. And it went into a lot of detail. But uh, anyway, that's the one that I remember specifically at the local regional library. I'm sure there are others around, but uh, when I got into this thing, you get, just got stacks and stacks and stacks and you can only memorize so much, you know. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, I did use that. Uh, okay. Do we and have I had another question um, about Lewis and Clark. Didn't they contribute quite a lot to um, naturalism, like our knowledge of uh, different flora and fauna, um, things that they quote unquote discovered um, on this journey? Did they, um, can you talk about their contributions to uh, naturalism? Uh, there's, a, there's a point up in uh, either Montana or uh, the Dakotas where Lewis or Clark signed their name on a thing and it's a state park up there as far as that's concerned. And one thing I forgot to mention Another Meriwether Lewis's job was to take care of the medical needs of the, of the expedition. And he went to Philadelphia to discuss with Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was the leading physician. And Benjamin Rush had figured out some kind of a pill because he thought that most people had too much liquid. So this pill, which contained mercury, was, uh, was issued. And, uh, he brought a thousand pills with him. So ever so often, everybody take one of these pills. And of course, the mercury would come out and they could, they could pinpoint where they've been because mercury stays there forever. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And that's up in the uh, Dakotas and uh, Montana. I'm sure they did that all the way to the West Coast. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, that, was, that was his main thing. He was also asking about that their contributions to naturalism, like the animals and plants that they discovered? Well, what they did was, uh, when they came back from the expedition and they left uh, the Pacific coast, they split up in two groups and they each explored different streams and rivers and they named them, uh, which was part of the uh, process. And then they reunited in the Mandan territory in the Dakotas before they returned to St. Charles. So I'm sure in, if you, if you had the journal and you printed it, I'm sure you'd find a lot of information in there. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't, wasn't able to do that. Okay, Henry, I have a question for you. What was their diet? What did the diet consist of for the party as they were on their expedition? What did they eat? What did they eat? They were eating as they were traveling. Oh, they, they shot wild game and uh, rabbits. And that, that was their main save. And there was, a two, there was two different instances where George Shannon was lost. 
for several days. And of course, he survived on uh, killing rabbits and eating them and before he finally reunited with them. Of course, that, I think that was on the way up. He was still 16 years old and still in training. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Oh, an earlier attendee asked if the museum is open for tours right now. Are the, is the museum open for tours? Oh, yes, 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 we are. We're limited in the number. Uh, it's at 10. And the 10, 10 people per tour is all is the, is the maximum that we can take. We are asking for advanced reservations. And we are, we are asking for advanced reservations for those. Yeah, that can be made on our website. That can be made on our website. Okay. Are they allowed to go in and see the house lounge, the Thomas yeah. Hart Benton murals in the house lounge? No, no, they are closed and, so until the legislative session is, ends in, sometime in May. The speaker of the house is in charge of that, and he felt like all things considered, he didn't want it open to tours. So it is presently closed. Okay. Unfortunately, it's one of the main attractions of the building. And it's free to tour your museum itself on the first floor of the Capitol, is that correct? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, we have the two museums. You can you can wander in and take a, take a quick look and go through all the exhibits and so on and so forth, certainly. Okay. We have one other question, and this may be more for Lauren or Carrie, how do we, how do they access the earlier Trailblazer programs? Okay, so this is a question for Carrie or Vaughn. Yeah, direct that to Carrie, she can answer that question. Yeah, we'll actually be posting those um, either on our website or on our Facebook page, probably both, exactly when, I'm not sure yet, uh, but we're gonna figure that out as we go and we are gonna have them available, um, basically on demand at any time. And I did also want to mention as far as capital tours, we do have uh, our entire setup of capital tours broken into sections and put online virtually. So if you're unable to make a trip to the capital, you can watch the same thing um, online. Of course, it's, you know, not in person, um, but, you know, it's, it's, if you can't come to the capital, it's the next best thing. And they are broke down um, by each category on our website in that website that I put down earlier for the educational resources, you can access, access those virtual tours through that same website. Thank you, Gary. Okay, anybody else? I just put the link for the tours. Um, to the direct link to the capital tours in the chat if people are, want, are interested in that. We also want to mention that our next program that we're putting on for the Missouri Trailblazers program about Thomas Hart Benton will be April 20th at 1 p.m. You can find out the information. Probably Lauren's going to pop that in there. Oh, you just did. Sorry. And then also you can continue to watch the Daniel Boone Regional Library website as well as check with the Missouri State Museum. One last call for any questions or comments. Well, I'm not. Thank you. We appreciate you all attending today. Uh, we hope that you have a great day. Take time to enjoy your history because it is your history there with the Missouri State Museum, as well as visiting nice with our library and the resources that we have to offer. Hope you guys have a great Tuesday. Thank you.